Mycelial magic, networked intelligence, and the mouldy way to grow your NGO. How to guide Beist a zeitgeist. Um, the, uh, the, a zeitgeist is the spirit of an age, and um, I don't like the spirit of this age very much. It seems to me like a child that doesn't want its carrots to touch its peas on a plate. Um, everything neatly divided and separated. And um, how do we bring it all together? Make a nice curry, a nice mixture, right? Um, if you think about the various problems that we're facing as humans at the moment, um, they're all interconnected in a very deep way. Uh, our psychological problems and our ecological problems and our social problems and our economic problems, they all have a, a, a root which is the same, which is a lack of connection, I would say. Uh, and here we are trying to do this and that, a little bit of a land working project, or uh, someone trying to reduce their carbon footprint, or someone doing a beach clean up and all that kind of, all this is great. But as a holistic approach to a whole planet wide problem, I don't think it's gonna cut it, I don't think it's gonna work. So this is a, a talk about a different type of a zeitgeist, a different type of a geist, a different type of ghost. Uh, this is a mycelia. Um, and look how beautiful it is, look how beautifully it connects. Uh, these things send hyphae out um, to explore and to experiment and to test and send information back between themselves. I'm going to talk a little bit about the intelligence in nature in particularly slime moulds and a little bit about mycelia and the mycorrhizal root network, which is how trees communicate beneath the forest floor. And I'm going to talk about how to apply that to NGO work. Um, I run a reforestation organisation. It's called RAIN. You can see on my t-shirt. RAIN means the Regenerative Agroforestry Impact Network. Um, we work in Brazil with indigenous groups and um, black women's groups in the slums and uh, poor rural populations as well. And I'll give you a little bit of an idea of the kind of thing we do. Um, we, um, yeah, I'll tell you about the, the project in Hesifi. When the pandemic kicked off, people were getting hungry in the slums of um, Hesifi up in the northeast. And uh, we helped out a community that was doing, um, that was doing urban agroecology, right? And they set up a demonstration center to show people how to collect rainwater with plastic bottles, for example. Um, how to make compost, how to do agriculture in the very tight, small areas that you have when you live in a slum. And that project went really well. Um, it was, we produced a beautiful booklet, which I've um, left in my tent. Um, and um, that booklet, uh, it was so successful, we, we shared media about it in, in the UK, raised more money, and that spread to nine favelas. And we've just got that translated into Arabic to use in the occupied territories as well. Um, the mycorrhizal root network, as we were here, is very good at sharing resources. It's very good at sharing information and translating across uh, borders, across things that separate us. So this is why it's a particularly beautiful and important metaphor, and not just metaphor, actually, spiritual inspiration for how, um, how I like to run my business. This is a slime mold. Can you see that? <coughs> So that's what a slime mold looks like when it's growing. Uh, slime mold is a single-celled amoeba. You can't uh, see it uh, without a microscope. And most of the time they're kind of wandering around and doing their thing, eating food like the rest of us. And um, when uh, they're, they're very good at networking. They're very good at um, finding, the, uh, finding the best way to transfer resources between themselves. When the climate changes, um, on a, a log or something like that. Slime molds do something very clever. They come together, they collectivize into a, um, it's, it looks like a mushroom. It's not actually a mushroom because they're not fungi, but um, they come together into these, these things and then they spore, uh, they kind of explode and individuals get up onto the air currents and they can float away to more humid places. Um, what can an individual amoeba do about the changing climate? Not very much. What can they do together? Incredible things. And I'd ask the same question for us. What can individuals do about 
desertification? Mm, it's a difficult question. What can we do when we, when we come together? Uh, amazing things. I don't even think we know what we can do yet. Um, yeah, networked intelligence takes a leap with uh, new technologies. Um, what I mean by that is, um, it's from Latour, this actually. He's, he, he, he comments that um, when we invented language, um, we could start to communicate to each other and, and share ideas. And then when we invented writing, we could start to note those ideas down and start to store knowledge. And then when we invented the printing press, we could share that much more widely. And each of these uh, jumps in tech has given us uh, a completely new world. It's revolutionized the world in ways that you, know, you couldn't imagine as a 12th century farmer somewhere uh, where the only book was the Bible what it would mean if people could communicate ideas. So we're at the kind of the beginning of a, well, we've had a, a tech revolution and we've got this new thing called the internet and um, there's a lot of porn on it. Um, and um, I think there's other things we can do with it. Um, so uh, slime molds are amazing. If you put, uh, they like oats. And um, if you put a couple of oats on a maze, they will find the quickest, uh, most efficient route between those two, those two points. Yeah, they solve mazes better than uh, four-year-old children. And um, people are still arguing about whether this represents intelligence. And uh, I've got a five-year-old, I think he's intelligent. Uh, this is, um, you can also keep them, they're a very good low-maintenance companion as well. You can keep them in jars and uh, just feed them an oat every now and again. Um, so this is uh, a bunch of oats. Uh, that's a slime mold that has colonized a bunch of oats. Uh, in 23 hours, they found the most um, efficient way to link up all of these oats. Uh, they were put in the position of the Tokyo Railway Network. Um, that's what it looks like. And they outdid the Japanese in terms of efficiency of distributing resources. They don't only map space, they also map time and perceive rhythms in time. Um, this is incredible. If you blast a slime mold with cold air, bear in mind it's a tiny little thing with no brain, uh, no nervous system, um, but if you, uh, they don't like cold air. So if you blast them with cold air, they retreat. And if you blast them an hour later, they retreat again, but they retreat more. And if you blast them on the hour every hour, uh, they learn the rhythm by the third time. So they're already retreating five minutes before you blast them on the, on the, on the third attempt. Yeah, they're a bit like, um, you know, when you set your alarm clock and you wake up a few minutes before, uh, before it goes off. Like, they're really good at that. And then if you don't blast them, they're already retreating because they're expecting it. So they have anticipation. Um, but then they adapt to the fact that you're not blasting them. Um, so they have anticipation, they have recall, and they can, they can do all these incredible things. If you leave it for eight hours, and then you blast them again with cold air, then they retreat a whole load. Very, very clever. They also do something a bit like farming. Um, if they encounter some bacteria that they can eat, then um, they might eat some of it, but keep, move it, move the rest of it somewhere else, so they can eat it later, which is more intelligent than me when I'm given a box of biscuits. <laughs> Salt, ah yeah. Um, this is another wonderful thing about um, slime molds. If they, um, they don't like salt, like most little cells, like most little things avoid salt because it dries them out. If you put a salt bridge between the slime mold and some food, they will learn to cross the salt bridge in order to get to the food, right? So if you, if you take a colony which has learned that and put it next to a colony which hasn't learned that, it will go across the salt bridge quicker, right? You can dry these guys out, by the way. You can, um, you can basically, yeah, dry them out, leave them for a year, rehydrate them, reanimate them. And if you do that with a colony which has learned to cross salt, and then you introduce it to a colony which hasn't learned that, it teaches its friends to cross salt, right? Super, super clever. So just summing up about slime mold a little bit, what do they do? They respond to threats and opportunities. They redistribute resources and information. They perceive rhythms in time and uh, space, and they predict the future, and they solve problems, and they guide individuals towards harmonious behavior 
with the collective as well. Wouldn't it be good if we could do that? Yeah. <laughs> so why do they do this? They make a super organism to make the uh, to make the whole more collectively resilient. How do they do this? They plug into a, a, some kind of a network. Hmm. Let's talk about shamanism. Traditional shamanism, uh, it doesn't really take place with um, startup techies um, from California. Um, normally, shamanism back in the day, and even in traditional communities today, is a, uh, a man or a woman going off on their own into the woods and uh, taking their mushrooms or drinking their brew. I'm just going to move this. And um, so the, the shaman works on behalf of his or her community. Uh, they do that by, um, for example, curing disease. That's quite, quite famous for doing that. Someone might come along with an illness. They'll take their brew. They'll come back with a cure for that. Um, also curing kind of collective disease when there's a plague going through the, when there's a plague going through the community. Um, there are tribes in Brazil in the jungle where the only thing people use ayahuasca for is to make pacts with the spirit keepers of animals. Um, so they will go into a trance, meet, uh, say, a monkey god, and <clears throat> make a deal with them. And the monkey gods will say, well, you can have three of us, and you're going to find us here. Uh, make sure you give us something in return. Um, that is an example of redistributing resources <clears throat> by plugging into a network and finding their way to the meat that they will use to eat. They might go and talk to the river spirits uh, if there's some kind of a disease situation going on. There's a distinction to be made between what's called brujaria and uh, shamanism. Um, brujos or witches work for the good of an individual against the good of the collective. Shamans, when they're doing their work, properly work for the good of the individual and the collective. <coughs> um, yeah. There's another thing to be said actually about um, traditional use of shamanism is in divination and particularly war divination. When are our enemies going to attack? Uh, is it a good time for diplomacy or is it a good time to attack them? That kind of stuff. So you'll see in all of these examples that I'm giving you here, the job of a shaman is to protect his tribe, or her tribe, and look after the collective. <clears throat> so if we think about that in our own context, what's the job of, what is our tribe at this point? And I would like to think our tribe is getting to be the whole world. Um, certainly the, the problems that we face are global problems. So if we're going to respond to them, then we need to start thinking about how to respond as a global uh, organism, I believe. How do we do it? Well, how do shamans do this? By plugging into a network. Um, I could tell you a little bit about this guy, Mestri Ireneo, Raimundo Ireneo Serra. So my lineage is uh, called Daimi. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Um, it's a syncretic, folk, Catholic, animist, and um, shamanic lineage from the jungles of Brazil. It's pretty strange. Uh, pretty strange mix. Um, this guy, Mestre Ioneo, was a two metre tall black man who went as a rubber tapper uh, to the area. Actually went to, as a border guard initially. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about his history and uh, to uh, illustrate some of these points. Um, responding to threat and opportunity. So there was this black guy in the forest and uh, doing something which was, well, firstly, this was, he was born two years after slavery, so he was born in a, a really racist time. And the indigenous people were practicing what was considered devil worship. And he got involved in it, and he became locally famous as a healer, um, treating, including um, his enemies. There was one, there was a, a, a guy who was particularly persecuting him, a guy from the army, I believe it was. Um, 
who got so ill that he couldn't uh, ride his horse anymore. And um, they said, you've got to go and see the, got to go and see this black guy in the woods, otherwise you're going to die. And um, he did. Um, this guy was surrounded, or his community was surrounded by the cops on one occasion uh, for practicing devil worship. And um, at a place called Villa Ivanechi. And the cop said to him, um, stop this behavior. And he said, no. And so they arrested him and they interrogated him. And by the end of the conversation, they'd managed to convince him, or he managed to convince them that he wasn't worshiping the devil and that he was doing good work. And they gave him a plot of land in uh, the, what, what became the city of Rio Branco, uh, where he set up the, the, a, a, big, um, a big center and immediately got his followers to plant food, lots and lots of food. And not very long after that, um, some, an English guy actually stole a rubber, uh, stole a rubber plant. I think actually he'd already stolen it by this point. Stole a rubber seed and started propagating it in Chelsea Physic Gardens and um, started producing rubber. And the economy there was completely dependent on rubber. And the arse fell out of the rubber market. And there was a, there was a, a, a famine in the area and all the people started coming off the land to this town of Rio, uh, uh, Rio Branco where 40% of the food in a famine was being produced by this guy and his followers. So there's an example of predicting something that was about to happen in the future and responding to it before it happened. And the result of that was he became a local hero and you can get a bus to Irineo Serra, which is his name. It's the, so the, 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 the bairro, the, like the, the district of, of town is named in his honor. Um, and in fact, the reason that, probably the reason that ayahuasca is, uh, came out of the jungle uh, and um, is because of this guy. I just, I'll illustrate that a little bit more. There's a guy called um, Caetano Veloso. You might have heard of, he's a musician, but he was a journalist. Um, and in about, when are we talking? I think we're talking about the third, I actually forget which decade it is. It might be in the, in the kind of 40s around then. <clears throat> he was sent to Rio Branco to meet this guy and um, talk to him about this strange new... Basically, the Catholic bishops were like, what the hell are you doing with our religion in the jungle? Um, and uh, so he was sent to go meet this guy as a journalist. And he did. And um, so he was met by Messi Rio Neo at the, at, the bus, at the bus stop. And he told him what his name was. And he told him that he had an injury. <clears throat> he told him he'd just out of prison. And he told him some various bits of his biography and completely blew him away. This is a bit of a trope that you see in shamanic stories of the shaman meeting you and telling you all about yourself. Um, he then fed him ayahuasca for three days. And we don't know what happened in those three days. But um, at the end of this, he gave a bottle of ayahuasca to Caetano Veloso. <clears throat> and he returned to uh, Rio. So he said, go back, go back to Rio, give this to some of your sensitive friends. And he gave some to Gilberto Gil. Anyone familiar with Gilberto Gil? Um, well, I'll tell you who he is in a minute. Um, so Gilberto Gil then, um, he decided, don't do this at home by the way, he decided to take his dose as he was getting on an aeroplane. And uh, the aeroplane landed in Sao Paulo uh, when it kicked in. And it landed, this was in the middle of the, detect the dictatorship um, in Brazil. Um, so we're actually a little bit later in history than I, than I thought there. Um, and at the airport, there was a military parade for a new uh, Air Force unit. And Caetano, uh, Gilberto Gil was overcome with love for, this, uh, for these people, even though they were part of this horrifically oppressive, uh, murderous regime. And he later became the culture minister of Brazil and was instrumental in getting ayahuasca on the uh, recognized as cultural patrimony of the country. Right, so um, pretty interesting stories emerging out of this guy. Um, all about harmony, resilience to the collective. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I was doing in Brazil. I, I went there. Um, how long ago was it now? About 16 years ago, I went to Brazil, to the jungle, uh, to learn about this particular lineage. And when I was there, I got bitten by a sandfly. Um, <clears throat> and I, uh, I got a, uh, uh, it's called leishmaniasis, I got an ulcer. That's my, I don't know if you can see that, but um, I love getting my... I love getting my wound out at parties. Um, anyway, you can come up later and I'll show you. Um, it was about the size of 50p. It was a flesh-eating colony on my skin, and I had it for eight months. 
and uh, people there, it's a very heavily colonised country and they told me I had to treat it with injections of antimonium tartrate, which is a heavy metal. And I didn't want to do that. I'd gone to Brazil very specifically to learn about this lineage and I'd, I was writing, a, oh, I've got some books here, by the way. I was writing a book about, um, about medicine, about magic, about autonomy and uh, things like that. And so I decided I wasn't going to do that. I decided I was going to treat it with ayahuasca. And um, most people thought I was crazy. Uh, I was living in the jungle, um, somewhat isolated at the time. And so I drank every morning for, at four o'clock in the morning under the guidance of a curandero um, and learned many things over about the four or five months that I was drinking that. Um, towards the end of that experience, uh, I met, um, I was just about, just about getting better, and I met a woman who kind of sang me back to, I mean, my, my body was nearly better. The, the, wound, the wound was, like, it would grow because it would fill up with pus, uh, and then I'd have to put a, uh, like, a mud pack on it. I did this every 10 days or two weeks or so. And then I'd sleep with the mud pack. The mud pack had, like, ayahuasca in it and all these different um, leaves. And the whole time I was doing diets and singing to the trees. I've missed that whole bunch of this story, actually. Uh, doing a whole kind of load of weird stuff with barks and stuff. Um, but anyway, this would kind of... Uh, in the morning, the, the, the mud pack would come off and it would take the scab off with it. And every time it was either bigger or smaller, depending on how I was doing with the, the healing process. I also did a lemon fast, which was... Uh, the juice of a lemon first thing in the morning, followed by four hours without eating, followed by lots of lemon juice in my food. And then second day, two lemons. Third day, three lemons. Four lemons, all the way up to ten lemons. And then back down, nine, eight, seven, so 19-day lemon fast. And then I did it again a couple of weeks later, uh, starting off with two lemons and going up to 20 lemons. And the reason you do that is because this ulcer, it can get through your blood and then it has a, has a cutaneous form and a visceral form and it can start to attack the cartilage in your nose and your ears and your stomach and all this kind of stuff. And so when I was doing this, people would say, you're crazy, let's go to town and I'll drive you around and you can see the people who've lost their ears and their nose from this. Um, but anyway, I'd, I'd seen lots of miracles from ayahuasca and I was in the lineage which kind of knew what we were doing. And that's what I wanted to do. So that's what I did. Uh, towards the end of this, I met um, a woman, her name was Jill. And uh, she kind of sang me, I was, I was mad by the end of this, by the way, I was really not mentally very well. And she kind of sang me back to health. Um, and by this time my visa had run out uh, and I had to skip the country and Bolivia was just about an hour away. So um, we went to Bolivia and in Bolivia, uh, that's the first time I got on the internet for ages. The first time I'd done very much really, I was 10 kilos underweight. Um, yeah, I, I, I had this thing, like I was hunchback as well because I was trying to keep, um, You've got to keep dust off from in the jungle. There's lots of dust and it's got parasitic flies and stuff like that. I had worms crawling out of my flesh on one occasion. Uh, like I pulled six like, th thread worm things out of me. Oh, it was wonderful. It was. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, it was pivotal. It was. Um, yeah, at least, at least nice as sucks, but um, I certainly certainly learnt quite a lot. But anyway, I came I came out of this and I went to I went to the internet shop and uh, two friends of mine had dreamt about me, and uh, that's always an interesting sign. Someone writes to me and said, "I've just had a baby and I'm very happy." Someone else wrote to me and said, "I've just got pregnant. And I'm very happy." And I emailed a friend and said, "Do you think if I went home and got this woman pregnant, if all my problems would go away?" And then I went home and she opened the door to the hostel and said, "Should we have a child?" And I'd known her about, yeah, yeah, I'd known her about three months at this point, and I said, yeah, and we did, um, that was the last time she menstruated, um, and um, I, I had uh, twins, uh, so I met her on January the 1st, and they were born on the following year on uh, like February, when, 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 when are their birthdays, February the 6th. Um, so yeah, quite a, quite a fast um, thing really. They were both born with birthmarks where I had my wound on my chest. And five years later I went to, oh well, I'll tell that bit of the story in a minute. Um, so then what happened was I went to, well, when she was pregnant I went to go and introduce myself to her parents. And they took me swimming in a, no, her brothers took me swimming in a, I thought that was feedback. Um, her brothers took me swimming in a uh, in a stream, 
And then five years later, I went back to visit them and show off the kids. I went to show off the uh, show them off to the uh, the curandero as well. And I said, "Look, it's left a look at the magic. It's left a mark." And he was like, "Oh, it left a tag, didn't it?" Because that's absolutely normal in the jungle. That kind of thing. Magic is everywhere there, um, and actually everywhere here if you look hard enough. Um, but so I went to go to went to go to the back to her hometown, and the stream had dried up. And her parents had taken the fish out of it to try and, uh, and they had these fish in a barrel for a stream that wasn't coming back. And all the dragonflies were gone and all the frogs were gone. And that whole region is drying up. There were, there used to be, I think, uh, five or six uh, rivers in the, the, the area, it's called uh, Chapal de, Nor de Norci. And they're all drying up. So I thought, well, what can I do about this? And started raising money. Uh, firstly, for to take a group of uh, farmers to an agroforestry system near there, and um, the guy driving the bus was the mayor of the next door town, and the town was called Cachoeira. Um, Cachoeira means waterfall in Portuguese, um, but the waterfall had dried up in the 1920s, and his dream was to see the waterfall flow again. So we started. He asked if we could fund a um, a sapling nursery in the local school, which we did. And uh, then the other school in the next neighbouring town, they asked if they could have one as well. So I got my last English student to pay for that one. Um, Russian guy uh, provided the money for that. And then what happened? Then we started reforesting the springs in the area. Uh, and then someone in Hesifi, which is this urban centre I'd mentioned previously, asked us, to get into, asked us if we could do one there. So we did something there and then the pandemic hit. People started getting hungry. And we started doing that urban agroecology thing. And this kind of thing just got completely out of hand uh, and now we're working with indigenous groups and this all happened through friendship networks uh, and following the model of the mycorrhizal root network and slime molds and mycelial networks um, that's a spring restoration we did I don't know if you can see that it's not a very good picture is it um, but restoring a spring you can make it flow again you can bring the water up if you do that enough to the hydrology of an area uh, or in some cases you can make it rain again because uh, when you grow trees they send particles into the air which cool the rain in and they also cool down the area which makes it more likely to rain. At the moment in central Brazil the desertification is so serious that the rain kind of sits in a cloud and then just plops all at once in an area and you get floods and erosion and, and then but it doesn't sink into the ground so it kind of stays there and it goes up again it goes somewhere else and it plops again. So the rainfall in, in Brazil affects the monsoons and the rains in North Africa and our climate here. Right? This is serious, serious business. Um, that's a sapling nursery run by kids in the school. You can't see it. I can see it. Um, yeah. Urban agroecology project. Um, I'm just going to tell that story... Did I mention that we translated into Arabic already? Yeah. I did, right? So that is following the wisdom of the mycorrhizal root network, which knows how to communicate good ideas from one place to another. Like we saw with the slime moulds, that know how to teach someone else to cross, to cross a salt bridge. We had translated that one into English for a Kenyan refugee, for a Kenyan refugee camp as well. And into Arabic. All right, let's talk about the mycorrhizal root network, also known as the wood wide web. Um, if a tree falls over in the, uh, in the forest, it opens up a space in the camp of canopy. And that is an opportunity, and it's also a threat. Uh, it's an opportunity for flowers and certain things which need uh, intense light. Um, and it's a threat because the microclimate of a forest is uh, cooler and damper and um, managed by the forest itself for its own benefit. So what happens then is that the mycorrhizal root network, which is the, the fungal threads between trees, um, they will send nutrients to that area to make the saplings in that area, or the seedlings, <coughs> grow quicker so they can plug that gap. Uh, and also, uh, they will encourage certain types of um, certain types of plants to grow in that in that place. If a dog or if a creature does a poo in the forest, 
that is also an opportunity. Um, but uh, one tree can't use a whole poo. So what will happen is it will be incorporated uh, into the soil and then uh, distributed around by the mycorrhizal root network as well to feed other trees. Because when you concentrate shit, uh, it, it's, a, it's an environmental hazard. And it's a little bit like when you concentrate money, it becomes extremely problematic. So in the same way as the mycorrhizal root, work, root network is wants to distribute resources, so for the benefit of everybody, we want to take money off generous but loaded people because it's not very good for them. So if you have lots of money or any time or any skills to bring to the network, uh, please come and talk to me. Speaking of time, how am I doing for time? It's 30 minutes. I've had half an hour, haven't I? Yeah. 30 minutes so far. Okay. Am I speaking for an hour or... Uh, am I speaking to half five or...? No, what did it say? What did it say? I think I was speaking to half five. Oh, oh. Sorry. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, I'll speak a little bit more and then we'll do some magic. Um, if a uh, if an insect attacks a tree, um, then the tree will produce uh, defense chemicals. Um, they do a number of things actually. A tree might uh, produce something that attracts ladybirds that uh, will eat, say, say it's aphids or something like that. Um, it will attract lady. It will produce something that attracts ladybirds. Um, if a uh, so when a tree is attacked, it produces defense chemicals that the insects don't like. So they can only eat a certain amount of it, and then they're off. To another tree but it also produces something called infochemicals which go down through the mycorrhizal root network off to other trees where they warn it about the fact there's an insect attack going on and the other trees will start to produce defense chemicals as well which means that when the insects go to those other trees they can't eat them which is good for the whole because you don't want a plague of insects um, we call them pests you know because we have monocultures uh, when a creature that likes those things arrives it does really well, and we call it a pest, but it's just a creature doing its thing in a ridiculous environment. Um, so how can we use that understanding of infochemicals in our work? Um, what does an infochemical need to do? Well, firstly, it needs to spread widely. Secondly, it needs to spread to other species. So for example, um, a Douglas fir and a, I think it's a, I think it's a beech. I actually forgot which one it is. No, it's a spruce. A Douglas fir and a spruce will communicate with each other uh, about um, threats in the area, about, for example, uh, insect attacks. So, based on that, right? What does a what does an infochemical need to do? It needs to spread widely. It needs to communicate to other species, and it needs to provoke the appropriate response, right? So I've been watching media reports of the Amazon burning since I was a child and I don't want to share them with my mum um, so they're not very good at spreading widely uh, and they don't really produce a correct response because if they did we wouldn't have the problem anymore. Um, the correct response uh, that we're trying to evoke is something different. So I want to give you an example of one of the uh, of how infochemicals informs our media. Um, there's a very beautiful song, uh, it's called Norosai Monote, and it's sung by, it's traditional to the Nokikoi indigenous nation, they're also known as the Katakina, if you've heard of the Katakina. Um, they don't like being called Katakina, because Katakina is actually a name given to three different tribes, <clears throat> I'm going to digress for a moment here, given to three different tribes from two different linguistic groups, and the Nokikoi, which means um, they have their own story of the creation of their creation and the creation of them is through a happy blast like a blast of tobacco up the nose the creation of other people is the sneeze uh, that was emerged after the happy blast so they don't like being associated with the other katakina um, anyway so we call them noki koi because that's their name um, this song uh, is a traditional song from about 100 years ago from the time of the rubber boom and the words go let's all sing and dance fires are coming strangers are coming let's call the rain and the strangers they're talking about are people from slave descent 
from the northeast of Brazil who were sent in to ethnically cleanse the area. It's a, it's a, it's a tragic story, and these people were um, murdered and enslaved uh, during, the, during the rubber boom. So we wanted to tell that story, and the way we did it was we got that recorded and then backed up by uh, two London orchestras, one of which is the London Mozart Players, and the other one is... Uh, uh, the other one, yeah, I've got my own backing band now, um, uh, Orchestra for the Earth. We got it filmed uh, in a beautiful church in London and had uh, Amazonian scenes projected onto the walls of monkeys leaping from tree to tree and stuff like that. And then we got Miriam Margulies to do the voiceover for it. Um, Miriam Margulies got in touch with me many years ago and said, I'm a distant relative of yours, would you like to go for a curry? Um, okay. Um, she's very strange. Oh, you know who I'm talking about? The woman in Blackadder? Yeah. Yeah. Um, farts a lot on TV. Um, she likes to get in touch with her relatives and find out how they're doing. Um, it's her hobby is her family tree. Very strange woman. But anyway, so she did the voiceover for it. We got it on Classic FM. Uh, we got it on, um, on, on the radio. Um, it spread widely. We wanted to bring together the classical music community and ecology. Another aspect of that project is that the tree used to make violin bows is called uh, Pau Brasil or Brazil wood. It's also called Pernambuco. It's massively endangered. There's probably about 5,000 of them still standing in the wild in Brazil. Um, Brazil is named after this tree, Brazil wood. Um, Braza in Portuguese means the glowing embers of a fire. And you used to make a, they used to make a red dye out of this, uh, out of this stuff. Uh, so it was traded as a commodity. The same way the Ivory Coast is called the Ivory Coast because of the ivory, and there's like, I think it's like a hundred elephants left there. Um, there's not very much Brazil wood left in Brazil. And then in 1840, um, it was discovered that it's uniquely resonant, right? Um, and it's also very strong. So you, you, know the, you have concave violin bows, they go concave, they're that shape, right? That's because Brazil wood is very, very flexible. It's very good to work with, but also the resonance of it is perfect for for music and in fact the sound of a violin which Mozart was familiar with for example is the sound of the of that particular wood if you know like Mongolian uh, violins they use like bow and arrow shaped bows and it's quite a kind of screechy sound that comes out of it that's because they're not using Pernambuco bows right um, so this was a way of bringing the again bringing the classical music uh, community in support of ecology because classical music people are kind of interested in classical music rather than amphibians in the forest that are going extinct. Um, so that's gone quite well. Uh, we planted 50,000 of those trees working with indigenous uh, communities and state municipalities and uh, kind of all over the place, distributing them to agroforestry systems here and there. Um, a couple of weeks ago in Bristol we launched a, an ensemble called Pernambuco, which is um, a strings ensemble which is doing, uh, doing music around this thing as well. Um, so again, this is following Infochemicals. We found a way of spreading widely this message, uh, going to into different communities across the different species and provoking the appropriate response. Because when people hear music or art or, uh, or, or a good story, they respond by producing dopamine. And dopamine opens your mind to further possibilities and it's, it's good in language production and it's good in uh, pr producing new ideas. Whereas when you see images of burning forests, your brain produces cortisol. And when you produce cortisol, you do what you've always done, like pattern thinking, addictive behavior. Um, a good example of this is when, uh, when there's a fire in a building, often everyone will run out of the front door of the building and they'll, they'll trample each other on the way out. You can interview them afterwards and say, there's 15 exits. Why, why did you come out the, why didn't you go out the other exits? Like, oh, I didn't think of that. Because yesterday they went out the front door, and the day before they went out the front door, etc., etc., etc. So when we panic, we do what we've always done. Whereas when we're inspired by art and music, we do something different. Yeah, exactly. That's why in schools you have a fire drill. You know? So because you're, you're you're making a learned behaviour, which uh, which you can respond to when you're panicking. Um, so that's trees and music. Can you see that? Yeah, you can. Um, that is how we manage our business. So the left-hand side is a centralized network. Uh, most charities, if you give them the money, they will centralize it and they will distribute it as they see fit to uh, their beneficiaries. It's a colonial model of, uh, of intervention in um, what used to be called the third world. 
Um, the, this on the right there is a distributed network, like a mycelial network, right? So what we do is we, um, if, if a business gives us money, we basically introduce them and, oh nice, uh, we introduce them to a, for example, an indigenous community, and then we facilitate the transfer of funds between the one and the other, and we also facilitate the transfer of media from the indigenous community back to them, and then they can share that with their network, and that's good for everybody because people like buying from businesses that have a have a decent um, social responsibility. Uh, people like working at businesses; they get lower staff turnover. They don't have to retrain their staff. Higher productivity from their staff. All of those benefits happen to the business, uh, and they can actually make an impact. Whereas if, I, I've talked to businesses where they know they've got a tree planting thing going on somewhere to offset their carbon, but they don't know where it is. And it might well be in a conifer. Um, monoculture that's going to end up in IKEA bookshelves on landfill, you know. So we're connecting people more or less directly. And also, it's not exactly directly because working with the indigenous world is very complicated. Um, they've been screwed by people who look like me ever since first contact. Um, so when things go wrong, they can go really badly wrong. And um, they also have a different sense of time, a uh, different conception of time, really. Um, I'm speaking, you know, very broadly about the entire indigenous world. Obviously, there's different stuff going on in different groups. But generally, when a software company wants something done by next Thursday, they're expecting it to be done by next Thursday. Um, whereas indigenous people don't really think like that. Um, we also do schools twinning work. So we put together UK schools and indigenous schools in Brazil, and they swap, um, they both uh, set up sapling nurseries and they swap uh, information about that. We've got 36 lesson plans um, which are linked to the UK schools curriculum introducing indigenous knowledge to uh, to children and that's not just in uh, ecology it's also um, history and it's music and it's uh, wide range of things. Also hitting the SDGs, the S Sustainable Development Goals which is part of the Ofsted requirements now. Um, so we can help out schools because um, they don't know how to do all this stuff. Um, I'll give an example of one of the bits of um, wisdom that's in those lesson plans is about the uh, Paranal Pine, which is a tree sacred to the Kangang indigenous nation. The Kangang um, <coughs> have been cultivating this tree, well, them and their predecessors called the Protoje, um, the, the Je uh, linguistic group. Uh, they've been cultivating this for at least a thousand years to produce different strains which give pine nuts at different times of the year. So originally, and this thing goes all the way out to the dinosaurs, they had this thing, uh, Arucalia angustifolia is. Um, so originally it produced pine nuts one month a year. Um, but they have 17 different strains of this now, and the different clans have produced these different strains that give nuts at different times of the year, which means they attract, so for nine months of the year they have pine nuts, which they eat, and they give you all, uh, blood and stuff like that. But they also, for them, they're very good for hunting uh, because they attract uh, they attract animals and birds and things like that. Um, and you get these explorers reports, uh, they're, they're kind of going off to the jungle and saying, I found this wonderful shooting today, uh, with no idea that they're in a finely micromanaged uh, forest environment. Um, it's really good for regenerative work as well because the birds that come uh, come in have been eating whatever's growing for the other nine months of the year. So they've got the seeds in their guts and they'll poo them out and that's an opportunity for a wide range of species to uh, to come back. So I was talking to a guy from Exeter University who is literally a PhD in the Kang Gang and he didn't know that, right? <laughs> so again, making connections between the academic world and the people who know stuff in the jungle. That's our secondary schools program. Um, you can't really see it, but um, that is the grammar school at Leeds. Uh, they've got 14 hectares, which they're rewilding at the moment, and they worked with a, a Terena indigenous school. Um, and they were doing stuff like um, taking pictures of their food and then passing their, uh, kind of sending them to each other, the indigenous people, talking to their grandmothers about their traditional food and English people. They're learning about food miles there. They're learning about like uh, nutrition, learning about all sorts of stuff. Um, I will say that also that this um, distributed model is how we do our governance, which is to say I'm not the director, I'm the co-director, uh, and all our decisions are made collaboratively, including like the most junior uh, 
volunteers who have, uh, you know, have quite good impact in, input into what we're doing. Um, yeah, just briefly, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this, the Imperial Research, uh, about psilocybin in the brain. Um, when you take psilocybin, actually I was part of this research, they put my brain in an fMRI scanner and they got me to look at pictures and say if I could see anything in them and then they gave me psilocybin and monitored my anterior cingulate cortex uh, and uh, asked me again. And anyway, what, what, what psilocybin and what a lot of psychedelics do is they um, inhibit the part of your brain which connects, which centralizes information, let's, let's put it that way. Um, so different parts of your brain start to communicate more directly. So it's a decentralizing force in the brain. An example of that would be synesthesia, which is where you hear, a, where you, you see a sound, for example. So there's a bit of your brain interpreting a sound by saying it's like blue and purple coming out of a speaker or a drum. And then that information gets kind of centralized through the anterior cingulate cortex and it goes, no, it isn't. It's a sound. Stop seeing it. So you don't see it. But with synesthesia, the senses get mixed and you can see sounds and uh, you might feel somebody else's uh, emotions. And, but you can feel that anyway, but it increases that. So again, we're talking about um, kind of back to shamanism and decentralization. This is Robin Carhart Harris, who was the, um, the leading scientist in the psilocybin trial. What would it mean if you were to blow up a capital city? Regions which don't normally communicate, communi communicate more. And that was give him giving an example of what psilocybin does to your brain. He was not advocating that we blow up a capital city, so don't get any ideas. Um, here's a question. Could the networked intelligence of a distributed collective respond to the collective challenges we fail to meet as individuals? What do we reckon? Could the networked intelligence of a distributed collective respond to the collective challenges we fail to meet as individuals? In a very much similar way, what we're interested in is bioregional hubs, which are local areas, uh, usually congregated around a school or a, an educational institution, but they don't have to be, where uh, local businesses, local landowners, conservationists and schools can get together and do their thing in their local area, because that, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's another example of a, of a decentralized, uh, decentralized network. To that end, we've just, in the process of launching REN, uh, which is a regeneration network, um, and part of that is um, a, an online space where schools can share their, regener their regenerative projects. Um, so for example, they might um, have pictures of some land which they're going to uh, reforest, or pictures of their uh, sapling nursery that they've built. And they can be tagged with various different things. So for example, if you're in, uh, let's say, Kent, and you've got a bit of land you want to reforest, you can look on, you can look into that in, in, into that network and find out what's going on in Kent with, uh, with sapling production. Um, but this is um, it's, it's the evolution of the school's twinning uh, network between uh, UK and Brazil, because if you want to find a school that you can, that your school can uh, communicate with about these these various different interventions that you're doing in an indigenous school in Brazil, it's a way of kind of bringing that together. And also it's, um, it's centralizing knowledge about, centralizing and distributing knowledge about how to, how to do uh, a sapling nursery from seed all the way up to um, planting them out, because uh, particularly primary schools, even secondary schools, a lot of teachers don't really know how to do that, and it's, it's quite complicated. And um, we spoke to the, uh, uh, the Forestry Commission about this um, quite recently. They've, there's nothing, um, there's no centralised database of knowledge on how to do um, tree planting like that. I'm getting towards the end of my talk. Um, um, we don't have any connections in Australia. I'm looking forward to hearing about it. What was going on in Australia? Okay, let's talk afterwards. Um, 
so what I'd like to do is just kind of change the pace a little bit and invite invite us to kind of plug into a network ourselves. Um, and I'm going to do that with your permission, with a little bit of hmm, a, look, a collective meditation, let's put it that way. Is everyone happy to do this with me? Yeah. All right, good stuff. If you want to put the phone down so you can join us, that's, that's cool. Um, all right. I'm going to keep the microphone on. So what I'd like you to do is make yourself nice and comfortable and just take a moment to remember how you got here. That means remembering how you got to the site and how you find your way to this tent. And take a moment to connect to the ground beneath your feet and the haystacks that you're sitting on. And let's take a nice deep breath. Ah, that's right. And then let it go, and you can keep your eyes open for the moment, actually. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to just find a point in front of you, a little bit up, uh, it could be on the wall behind me or wherever it might be, and just put all of your mind into that point for the moment. That's right. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to a point in the air, halfway between that point on the wall, and your eyes. So you can go ahead and do that now. Put all of your attention into that point in the air. And just notice how it feels. I know your eyes are going to be getting a little bit tired, but don't close them yet. You can, when you do close them, you're going to drop into a lovely relaxed state. But just for the time being, just go with me. What we need to do now, in fact, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to one inch in front of the eyes. And you can go ahead and do that now. Notice how it feels. That's really good. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to one inch behind the eyes. Go ahead and do that. Let the eyes close. Notice what it feels like. Put your attention where consciousness arises. Whatever that might mean. Indeed, it might not mean anything at all. That's really, really good. And then just take your attention up to the top of your head. Just relax all the muscles in the top of your head and then send a wave of relaxation down through the body, through the head, neck, shoulders, down the arms, down the back and down the front of the body, to the waist, to the knees, to the feet. That's really good. You're doing really, really well. I'm a hypnotherapist, by the way, if it wasn't obvious. Um, I can't hypnotise you, but I can invite you to follow these words and see where they take you. What I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to count one, two, three. On three, you're going to pop the eyes open. They're going to open. And I'm going to count three, two, one. On one, you're going to close the eyes and go twice as deep as you are at the moment. So one, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down. All the way down, twice as deep as you were before. That's really good. We're going to do that a few more times each time going twice as deep. So, one, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down. Twice as deep as you were before. Relaxing and letting go. That's right. Feeling really good as you relax. And noticing that the deeper you go, the better you feel. And the better you feel, the deeper you go. We're going to do that one more time. One, two, three, open the eyes. Three, two, one, all the way down. Deeper and deeper. All the way down. That's really good. Any sounds around you are just triggers for you to relax a bit more. And if you need to wiggle or shift your position, you can go ahead. And let's take ourselves now to the woods, to the forest. And this can be a forest you know, or it can be a forest you're imagining for the first time now. Just imagine yourself walking. Imagine the feeling of the leaves beneath your feet. Imagine the sounds in the forest. Maybe there are birds in the forest. Feeling the coolness of the forest air on your skin, the humidity. That's right. Maybe you're seeing the colors of the forest. You can just make those colors a bit brighter. 
make those edges a bit sharper as you walk, relaxing into this beautiful forest landscape. Until you come to an oak tree, a lovely big oak tree, and I want you just to imagine feeling the bark on that oak tree, and then running your hand around as you walk around the oak tree, and finding that it's one of those oak trees with an opening in it, which is hollowed in the middle, and a very good space just for you to sit down in. a beautiful spot for you to relax in the middle of this oak tree. Just spend a moment there and then feel your way down into the wood of this tree, into the roots of this tree, sending your mind down through the roots to where they branch and get smaller and smaller until they connect into the mycorrhizal root network. And you can feel it burrowing through the moist earth, containing all the husks of the past, all the seeds of the future, connecting across to the other trees, the other plants in the network. Really good, you're doing really well. I'm just going to spend another minute or two here. And I'm going to share with you a, a poem and an incantation. And it's about the mycelial network. And as I'm sharing this, I'd like you just to imagine the connections beneath the forest floor. And also in your own lives, imagining what connections you want to make and also what connections you might want to break because the mycelial threads are always rebuilding themselves changing their focus drawing away from situations which aren't nutritious anymore and exploring new connections. So maybe there's certain connections that you don't want anymore, and maybe there's certain connections you want to refigure or reconfigure in your life. And maybe there's new connections you want to make. And I'm going to say this incantation three times. Mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others, we touch with our tendrils, entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies, in pleasure and pain, twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots and forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor, love in the heart as it boils in its fervor, love in the stories we tell to each other. Loving the dendrites that dance as they measure mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others. We touch with our tendrils entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies in pleasure and pain. Twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots and forever. Loving the fingers that reach forth with ardor. Loving the heart as it boils in its fervor. Loving the stories we tell to each other. Loving the dendrites that dance as they measure mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others. We touch with our tendrils entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies in pleasure and pain. Twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots and forever. Loving the fingers that reach forth with ardor. Loving the heart as it boils in its fervor. Loving the stories we tell to each other. Loving the dendrites that dance as they measure. Just spending another moment amongst these connections, deep in the earth. Before we begin to draw ourselves back, taking the nutrients, the information that we require, as we draw ourselves back into the roots, back into the trunk of the tree, and then back into our bodies, the bodies that we're going to use to connect 
to move forward with our plans and our projects. And I wonder what those hands are going to do. I wonder what hands they're going to shake. I wonder what emails they're going to be typing, phone calls they're going to be making, doors they're going to be opening. And I wonder where those feet are going to take you. And I wonder what thoughts are going to be passing in your mind that you want to bring into reality. And when you're ready, you can just imagine yourself getting up out of the tree, walking back the way you came through the forest, knowing that you can come back to this place in your mind whenever you like. And then when you're ready, you can give your toes a wiggle, and your fingers a wiggle, and you can come back. Feeling good. Feeling connected. So I'm here until half past five. I don't know what time it is now. Take a moment to bring yourselves back. If anyone wants to talk to me, in fact, if anyone's got questions, maybe now's a good time to ask questions, open it up. Um, I've done enough being the guy with the mic, so maybe we can just come a little bit closer and have a conversation.